Sam, to introduce our speaker. back on. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really excited about our speaker today. His name is Jason Gillette, and he has worked in service to others his entire career, from serving his country in the United States Marines, being a personal trainer, to holding leadership roles at both the State Education Department and State Health Department. Now Jason is the owner and director of Guild Consulting, which focuses on public health and health disparities in Arizona. Due to his passion for health and community, he has been invited to serve on several boards, including the Mayo Clinic Community Advisory Board, Arizona State Southwest Interdisciplinary Research Center Advisory Board, Arizona Public Health Association, and as a HUD Grievance Officer in Phoenix. Jason believes that health in its full scope allows for everyone to give their best to themselves, their families, communities, and careers, and that this is essential for the change we want to see in ourselves and in our communities. In its definition of humanism, the Humanist Magazine notes that humanism recognizes human beings as a part of nature and holds that values, be they, re be they religious, ethical, social, or political, have their source in human experience and culture. This is what Jason will address today. Without further ado, please extend a warm welcome to our speaker, Mr. Jason Gillette. It got dark quickly. Is that <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if that's, can everyone hear me? Is that, is that, am I speaking? Everyone can hear? Okay. Hi, again, my name is Jason Gillette, and again, I'm so grateful and honored to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I don't remember all the things she said about my bio, but I did some of that stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting is that when I worked for the Department of Ed, we had to work with organizations in the community, and we found that culture was a really big part of that, right, and understanding what culture meant. Can you, I'm hearing myself now. That's a good thing. That means I'm in the zone, right? But anyway, so we had to understand culture. We had to understand perspective because there were some very gross issues that were happening in our education system, right? There were resources that were being mismanaged. There were organizations and there were teachers that weren't getting the services and, and, and the resources they needed. But to do that, we had to understand the culture and the dynamics of those communities so we could better understand how to service them. And the same thing happened as the chief of the tobacco program for the state health department, right? We talked about how, am I, should I pull it down some? Oh, to, to, okay, I'm gonna eat this thing. Uh, is that better? Oh, right. I feel like Barry White now, you know? Was, I'm just, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So when, as the chief of the tobacco program, we understood that, again, big business was targeting cultures and populations because they wanted to marginalize them. And so we had to understand how cultures intercepted with business and how they inter interacted with product. And so culture was a big thing about how we got programs, how we got interventions, how we got things to move in the way we wanted them to. So from that perspective, I would like to present to you cultural relativism. And I'd like to frame it because if we really got into the depth of cultural relativism, it would take about a week and a half. And so Roxanne said, I have, I have an hour. So we got to condense it. So I wanted to see if that was okay with you and I had to change the slide just so that way I could frame it a little bit better because we were talking about trajectory and policy and health and education. And I mean, again, no one has a sleeping bag so I don't think you guys are ready to stay <laughs> quite that long. But we'll see if we can get this truncated a little bit for you. So this is my crew, okay? This is the people that I roll with. Those, is, that's my family here, okay? That's my son, he's also sitting back there. Uh, and then those are my two dogs. That's Gotti and Gracie. They're German short hairs. They are in, indefatigable is the word I learned. That means you can't get tired, right? You will not tire out. And that's what those two are. They are indefatigable because they will not sit down. They won't lay down and they will not do anything but run. So 
This is my family, um, and I, this is, I just want you to know who I am, so that way you understand this is how I roll, right? Uh, I wanted to start with a quote, as I like to, because it frames everything that we do. And so I like this quote for two reasons. One, it gives us structure and how we're going to understand the context of what we're going to be talking about. And I like it because I think I made it up. So <laughs> to agree or disagree is human, but to understand is wisdom. And I like the way that it's broken up because to agree or disagree is what we can do as humans. That's our job. I don't like this carpet. I love the ceiling. I don't like this. I don't like this. I like that. We all like and dislike everything. We have the right to agree or disagree. That is our right and our privilege, right? We get to choose what kind of life we live. We get to choose how we live it and where we live it, right? That's our, cho our choice. But there's an alternative. There's an other option for all of us. We can do that. We can also look to understand their and lies the wisdom. Therein lies our ability to take our human instinct and just put it in our pocket for a second. Just put it in our pocket for a second. And then go look and engage to understand. From there, we change things. That's where the change comes from when we look to understand. Because it's easy to disagree or agree, right? Do you like these chairs? There you go. <laughs> Do you understand why they're heavy? Because <laughs> everyone has to sit in them, no matter who they are, right? So it's that context, right? It's when we agree or disagree, that's great, that's fine. But let's put that in our pocket just for a second, just for this hour if we can. Let's look for wisdom and see if we can find a nugget somewhere in this presentation so we can draw a little bit closer to those who may not look, think, believe, understand, walk, talk, comb their hair, or lack thereof, because what makes us different actually makes us very much the same. And I'll prove it. We're going to understand context of what we're looking at, right? Because I need to frame this. Because if we really talked about cultural relativism, again, we'll be here forever. So we're going to frame this. What is cultural relativism? Simply put, cultural relativism is me saying that I see your culture and I'm going to step out of mine just enough so I can understand your culture. Because within the context of my culture, I don't quite understand or it doesn't align or I'm not able to because of those conflicts. So I need to just say, OK, I have my culture and I respect and own mine. Let me understand yours. What is it that you're trying to, what is it that your culture is different than mine? And how can I understand that? Whether I agree or disagree with it, I already put that in my pocket, didn't I? Right? There's a little London for you. <laughs> I went to the University of Central London. I just, every once in a while, I just, a little bit. So my cultural relativism is understanding the culture of another without losing value of your own in the hopes to understand theirs. So it's not, about, it's not an attack or it's not an affront to say, I need to disown my culture so I can understand somebody else's. No. You can have your culture and just understand theirs. And that's what we're going to look into. Ethnocentrism, that's another big $10 word, as Ali always says. He said a $10 word. It is a $10 word. It means that my culture is right and everybody else's is wrong because I'm the dominant culture of the society. Therefore, I get to put the rules, I get to put the parameters, I get to define what's right, I get to define what's wrong, I get to define what's moral, I get to define what's immoral because my ethnocentric culture says that I'm right <laughs> and all of you are wrong. And how unfortunate is that? How, how limiting is that when I have to live up to the expectations of another culture just because? So that's what we're looking at. So we're not going to go into ethnocentrism in depth. We just want to talk about it to see that there's a difference. Cultural relativism, relativism rather, is understanding culture from the context of culture, not from our own, but from theirs. Ethnocentrism is saying, mine is right, and I'm judging every other culture based on my culture, and therefore everything else is wrong. That doesn't align. That's the two things. So I just want to put frame and context into what we're going to be talking about so that way we can get through this beautifully. <coughs> Cultural differences. What makes us different is what we believe and what we've experienced. Experience changes our culture. Even within this room, your experiences range. Some of you have seen things and have been alive when some amazing things have happened. I was just driving yesterday and I said, I saw the fall of an entire industry in my lifetime. 
my son will never know what a taxi cab is. <laughs> I remember taxi cabs. No one remembers taxi cabs like they were. Like, I saw the fall of an entire industry. How did that change my culture? How did that change how I engage the world? It all does. I was born in the 80s, right? The coolest decade in the world. <laughs> I saw some cool stuff. Technology changed my culture. Music changed my culture. Sports changed my culture. It was a really cool time to be alive because technology was coming up with me. But these things change our culture, and they change how we see things. But I think, personally, there are some awesome common grounds that we can start standing on because of that, because we've seen these things. And now we can start creating some rel relativity. When you see different, what do you see? When you see something that's different than what you understand, when you see something that is different than the way you have engaged the world, how do you box that up and quantify that? When you see children, what does it look like? On the previous slide with the, the uh, more culturally diverse populations, when you see something that different, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Oh my God, that's so different than what I'm used to. That's bad, because it's different than what I'm used to. I would never wear that. That doesn't match with my shoes. <laughs> There's no way. There's no way I could put that on and make it look good, right? I couldn't do it. But do we classify different as bad? Sometimes we do, innately, because it's different than what we're used to. Change can be really scary. And if someone like that moved in your neighborhood, would you be like, <gasps> or would you move in and get close and understand, like connect? They may have very similar principles to what they want out of life, how they see the world. But until we say that what they look like and what they think about isn't who they are, but just the representation of their culture, then it is easy. Then I can talk to you, and you, and you, and all of you. Because different doesn't mean bad. It just means different, and so it's it's, all, it's incumbent on us to really be mindful of what that looks like and how to categorize that. Different isn't bad. And I'll show you an example of when it is or when we believe it is. <sighs> this is rough. 1930s. What was happening in the 1930s? Let me think. Let me think. Uh, Amelia Earhart was flying across the world in her airplane telling everybody that women were just as strong and just as intelligent and just as beautiful as men were. She referred to fear as paper tigers. Who's afraid of a paper tiger? Punch it in the face, right? Mm -hmm. Paper tigers are nothing. And so she was de demonstrating how powerful women were in the 1930s. 1937, she crashes right off of Howland Island, never to be seen again, unfortunately. That's happened in the 1930s. There's a young artist who is in the military, he's kicking butt and taking names, and he is rising to the top of the ranks. He's also a mama's boy, but nobody really knows that. He's rising to power in Germany in the 1930s. Who is this? Hitler. Adolf Hitler. He's moving. And so this has happened in the 1930s. We just finished World War II not too long ago. We're going into the precipice of World War II, or World War I, rather, excuse me. Thank you. Someone said it. World War II, right? And so we're going to the precipice of that. NASCAR is getting its, its start, right? Prohibition's in place. And so to outrun the cops, you gotta have a really fast car. And so people are rigging their car to outbeat the, out, it's true. This is what's happened in the 1930s. And so NASCAR gets its start because I gotta beat the cops. <laughs> it's not gonna drink itself. We need to get this to our customers, right? So this has happened in the 1930s. Albert Einstein's theory of relativity is coming in. And it, everyone's thinking it's ridiculous. You can't prove that light can bend. That's absurd. He did. He did. What else has happened in the 1930s? A lot. The Great Depression is happening in the 1930s. A lot. The stock market crashes, 1929, right? It just creates this huge economic downturn for the United States. A lot has happened in the 1930s. Actually, the Federal Housing Association is also doing their own work. They're doing arts and crafts, if you will. And how are they doing it? Well, they're drawing maps. They're drawing maps. Some of you know what this is, and for those who don't, I will go through it in detail. But before that, I will drink. <laughs> Not prohibition drink. 
district. So the Federal Housing Association is creating these maps across the country saying that, hey, this is how we want our cities to look, right? When different means bad. When different means bad, this is what you see. Um, I was, I was going to say a quote at the end, but I, I, for some reason I feel compelled to say it now, and I'm, I think it'll land. One of my favorite philosophers, his name is Marie Arroway. His name is also Voltaire. And he says, those who can make you believe absurdities will make you commit atrocities. Okay? Listen to what I'm telling you. This is when, da when different is bad. When nothing that differs between me and you is just our skin color. That's what you're seeing. Does that red say hazardous? Thank you. <laughs> Could you imagine if what I called you, sir, was hazardous? I wouldn't feel good. <laughs> you're a hazardous human being. That's powerful. We don't understand that words are labels, and labels hold on to us, and they keep us, right? Because they define us, right? Culture can be defined by experiences, and if your experience is this, what is your culture telling about you, and what is your culture saying about that to the world? Don't talk to me. Don't give me an opportunity. I'm hazardous. We have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, different isn't bad. We gotta stop this. We really do. We really do. Whether it be you or somebody else, we gotta stop this. That map that you saw was from 1938. That was Philadelphia, 1938. How many from Philadelphia? From the Philly. <laughs> I got two in the back. <laughs> Throw it up. These maps are the exact same thing 85 years later. What do we see? These red areas are where they were considered hazardous, hazardous communities and the Federal Housing Association would not would not insure a mortgage in these areas. Therefore, guess what? You couldn't buy a house. And if you couldn't buy a house, guess what? You were renting. That's not that bad. Hey, it's a renter's market nowadays. If you got a house, rent it out. You'll make some money. 85 years later, what they did to those communities is they siphoned the money and the energy out of those communities. If you've ever read the book, The Psychology of Wealth by Charles Richards, he talks about money as energy, the exchange of energy. If you siphon money out of a community, you're taking their energy out. And what does that mean? Life expectancy rates in the same areas, the same. Obesity rates, access to education, access to jobs, the same thing back and forth 85 years later? You crippled the community because different was bad. Oh, well, you know, well, you can just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can figure it out. It's great. Give me some bootstraps first. Okay? You have to understand, you cannot create something out of nothing. You have taken communities and you've desolated them and you said, hey, there's your culture defined. Signs still didn't deliver. There you go, black people. Rise up. But you've defined the culture by, be, by defining culture as different and therefore as bad. And we see policies and policy, and this is just one example, I'm, t I'm telling you, this is not just an isolated incident, this is just one example over hundreds of years of policies, and this is not just for African Americans, Native Americans, Hispanics, the, whole, the list goes on, it's about creating differences. As long as we're different, I can create policies that substantiate that, therefore I can start controlling and defining your culture for you, because experiences influence culture. What does 85 years of poverty and counting say or impact or influence your culture? This is 1963. Redlining happened in the 1930s. This is 30 years later. I want to draw a parallel. I have some engineers in the room. If I, buy a, if I rent in 1938 and you buy in 1938, in 1968, what's, from, what's up with your house? Is it paid off? Heck yeah. Is my house paid off? I don't know. It's not mine. I'm still renting. See, I'm still actually paying. 
a matter of fact, if you look at it from an economic perspective, inflation still grows up. So rent in 1938 is not rent in 1968. I'll tell you that right now. So guess what? Now, not only am I paying rent every year for 30 years, I'm paying more rent every year for 30 years. What else, what else is happening in 30 years? I'm getting older. Can't work like I used to. Can't put in all those hours. But I can't retire. To what? I gotta keep paying that mortgage. It doesn't stop. Right? So you create this gap, this wealth gap that is so large that you can't fix it. That's what you're seeing, right? Those are the examples of one different is bad. Cultural relativism is understanding culture from their culture, not from your own. Okay? So what we're seeing here is that when even in 1963, we could even move out. I don't want redlining. I'm not a part of redlining. Let me get out of here. I'm just move over here. Ah, not so fast. Get back over there. You're not allowed. The communities outside of those redlining districts put a pact. And they said, yeah, we will not allow anyone that doesn't look like us in our communities. We agree, right? Handshake, boom. And so you could even move out. Culture defined. You're not good enough where you're at. You're definitely not welcome over there. Culture defined. Do you understand? We'll see. The social determinants of health. There's an, when I d gave this presentation at a conference some years ago, I, I always started with ignorance begets. Okay, we're okay. Hold on, hold on. we got this. We got this. We got this. <laughs> See, ignorance begets. This is, no, I think we're right. I just can't hear anyone. So I think ignorance begets ignorance. ignorance yes. And so then, if that's the case, then poverty begets. Poverty. Boom. So we're rocking now. What happens is, these are the social determinants of health. Everything in here is determining how you and how healthy you really are. If you just look at the words backwards, your health is determined by your social standings and your social environment. Where you live, who you are, determines how long you're going to live. There's even research that says that your zip code can pretty much tell you how long you're going to live. In Scottsdale, the average that was 85258, I believe, is a Scottsdale zip code. Average life expectancy, is that right? <laughs> it's 150, what? It? 150. 150, yeah, that 150, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the life expectancy, yeah, probably 150, really. It's 85 years. But if you were to drive 14 miles south of that, you lose 10 years of life. The life expectancy, just 14 miles south of that is, four, is, 80, is 78, 70, oh, 74, rather. Just because of where you live. And you only, it's not even like you're in, like, from... Uh, New York to Botswana, it's not like that. It's to Scottsdale to Phoenix. And you lose 10 years of your life because of the environment you live in. This is what this is talking about. Where you live determines how, you li how long you're going to live for the most part. Social determinants of health is everything that you'll need to understand. Healthcare system, the community and con social context. You have a nice community. Looks like you have a nice community here. Do you have one at home, right? Do we have food and access to it? And I mean healthy food, not like Jack in the Box and, you know, well, we'll get that. <laughs> education. Do you have a, adequate education in your neighborhood? Or do you have to bust your child like 30 miles out so he can get a good education? We have neighborhood and physical environment. Again, does the policy in your, in your neighborhood support you? Do you feel just as safe as your neighbor under the laws and guidelines, guidelines as they do? Rhetorical. These are your social determinants of health. This is what defines how and why you live the way you do. It's all in context of these things here, okay? This is the number that I want you to remember. This is out of Kaiser, this is 2013 data. If you were born poor, 70% of the chance, you're gonna die poor. That's in America, this is just in America. This is the American dream says, hey, guess what? If you're born poor, If someone said, you have a 70% chance of winning the lottery, how many tickets would you buy? I'd spend every dime I had. <laughs> right? 70% 70, 70 chance to win it? I would, I would spend, I would, my, son, I love you. <laughs> I do. I'll buy you back, I promise. <laughs> no, he's worth more than that, far more. But that's staggering. 
that tells you all you need to know right there. You have a 96% chance of never making it to the making it rain state, right, where you're just rolling in the dough. 70% chance you ain't going nowhere. Nowhere. And I know from personal experience because I was homeless and I lived that 70% life. And 98% of the people that I grew up with are still within that 70%. It's that real. Like you don't get out because ignorance begets. Yeah. You can, and Maya Angelou says it best. She says you cannot do better unless you know better. And if your education system is poor, and the people that are in your community are poor, and they haven't had access to resources, and they don't know what's going on, and they're just perpetuating the same stigma that they've understood, and their parents told them, and you got redlining that went back to 1930, is it a surprise? Or is it unfortunate? You tell me. Education. Again, stressors. If I'm trying to learn, and I got to worry about, man, I wonder if I'm going to get beat up at the school, or if I'm going to come home to some to, I don't know what. I'm not worried about education. I'm not worried about learning because why? I was in a school, uh, as the director of school health, I went to a school to visit and it was in an underserved community and I talked to a 16 year old girl about education and she said the most truest words and I couldn't even say, she said, why even try? I'm not going anywhere. And statistically, she was 100% right. She wasn't going anywhere. The school was underperforming, she was underperforming, the community was underperforming, she was going to be right there 20 years from now, unfortunately. And what can I say to her except for, you know what, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It'll work. It works every single time. So we have to understand that things that define our culture, man-made or not, define our culture. And if we don't understand that, it's going to be really hard for us to engage people that look different than us. Because you can't understand. Like, I don't understand. You've been poor, your whole, everybody in your entire life since you understand your, has been poor and impoverished and, and been desolate? I don't, even under, I don't even know what that means. See, we can't understand that unless we step out. Humbly. Let me understand. What are the challenges? What are the things that you're going through? What are the things that keep you up at night? We need to understand. But we need to stop saying, you're wrong based on my values, because that's where cultural relativism stops. Because then at that point, we're practicing ethnocentrism, right? We're saying, hey, you're wrong, because my culture says that's not how we do it. Oh, you're wrong because I see things differently. Right? We, that's, that's not going to get us to connect and build and understand where we're going to be going. Believe. Someone say believe. 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 Right. <laughs> I was trying to, how do you make that rainbow come up? Like, you know, like, like little, like uh, the more you know type thing? I was trying to see how, they, I don't know how to do that. Do you, you know how to do that, Roxanne? Okay, I'm trying, I'm gonna do next time, if I'm ever invited back, I'm gonna hopefully get the thing going. <laughs> believing, I love this quote, it says, believing is a terrible habit, we all do it. It's not enough, it's just not enough. We don't believe in the human condition enough. We don't believe that people can just be people for the sake of being people, for the sake of being people. We don't believe that enough, and that's unfortunate. We're all human beings. We are good and bad at the same time. We, we occupy the same space every single time. I was asked, hey, if George Washington, the founder of our country, started this country and he owned slaves, is he wrong or right? <laughs> well, he's a product of his environment. Everyone owned slaves back in those days. It was the thing to do. It was like owning a, a Tesla. You know, it's like <laughs> everyone had a Tesla because it's cool. It's the thing to do. It saves you money. <coughs> Pun intended. <laughs> but that's not enough. Yes. He was the founder of our country. And yes, he did own slaves. You can separate them because he is a human, therefore he did something that was good and he did something that I don't really agree with personally. Because it impacts my future and my livelihood. Okay? I like to work, don't get me wrong. Love to work. Under my own conditions though. Just me. But believing is a terrible habit. We all do it. We just need to do it a little bit more. 
We need to believe in the human element more so than our own ideologies. We have to understand that people are people just for the sake of people, and that's okay. That's okay. So how do we improve cultural relativism? How do we just get better at this whole thing about connecting with people and, and, and doing all this jazz and being you know, happy and kumbaya and that kind of stuff? How do we do that? I think the slide before, this is how we do it. And after I looked at your website and the meetup, you guys are working with the homeless and you're working with the communities and you're getting engaged and you're starting to, you didn't need me here. <laughs> you didn't need me, I didn't, what do you want? You don't need me here. You understand, which is the premise. You understand. To understand people, you have to get in front of people. To understand culture, you have to experience culture. Take off the jacket. Step into someone's culture. I went to, um, this was about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I went to this refugee conference, and they were talking about female genital cutting. And it made me so uncomfortable, because I'm like, that is so, I, and it challenged me, because from my personal cultural perspective, I can't even understand what that's about. But instead of saying, oh, that's just disgusting, oh, I can't, no. You know what I did? I went up to one of them and I said, can you please tell me what the world this is about? Because I don't get it, and personally, it offends me, it hurts me, because I don't think it's, I don't know, I don't think it's right, but tell me why they do it. And so I learned that there are variant degrees, is, degrees rather, whoa, degreases? Did we just say that? We said that? Are we recording that? Is that something? Degreases? I don't know about degreases, but there are degrees of female genital cutting, right? There's, so there's mild, just like hot sauce, right? There's mild and all the way. Not to placate it, and forgive me, but there are very, I didn't know that until I got engaged, until I learned. I'm like, actually, no, there are some of it that's actually, I, it, I can't have a position on. And so when I learned and I dug in and said, this is what it is, it still bothers me. It's still something that I'm not sure how to feel about it because I don't know what it's about. I don't understand the cultural context behind it. But before I say, that's disgusting, anyone who does that, anyone who's a part of that is gross and unsat, I said, what do I need to learn about this? If we all did that just one more time than we, did, than we, did, than we do now, Man, I'd be out of a job. I would have no one to talk to. Because then you'd all figured it out. The more you learn, the more you understand. Because then we put our ability to agree or disagree, right, in our pocket. In our lovely little pocket, right? We put it there. Because now we're digging in to understand. So that's what that's about. Cultural relativism is saying, hey, you look different than I do, and you probably talk, think, and, ex and express yourself different than I do. Why? Tell me. I'm interested. Lean in. Don't push away. The next slide is just my contact information, so I don't think you need that right this second, because I want to share a story with you that, that happened to me when I was in the Marines. Um, I served in the Marines for four years. I was uh, in Iraq in 2003 and I was in Afghanistan for 9-11. When it actually happened, I was in Japan, and my buddy and I were watching the TV, and the news came on, and the buildings were coming down, and I'm like, oh man, that looks cool. That must be that new Die Hard movie. I swear, I thought it was a movie. And my Sergeant Major comes in, he knocks on the door, and, he open, and I open the door, I'm like, hey Sergeant Major, and he's like, you got six hours to call your family, tell them you're gonna be going somewhere you don't know where. Pack your bags, we're going. I'm like, where are we going? I'm not hungry. He's like, we're going to Afghanistan. I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 for real? I thought we were just playing. This whole Marine thing was like, you know, just, hey, we, you know, we salute here once in a while. And we, you know, I didn't, we were like, we're not going like, to do something. Right? We're, he's like, yeah, this is what you signed up for. This is what it's about. I can tell you, standing in front of all of you, I have never been so proud of myself. I can tell you, I've traveled the world twice. I've seen people that are darker than my suit that I absolutely could not be so grateful that I met them. I've seen people whiter than the clouds that I've been so impressed with. It doesn't matter what we look like when we realize that all around the world, everyone is really, the rest of us, right? The, the, the normals, right? Because there's this little cup of areas where people who are on the outsides that are 
creating the mess. The people, the general people, really just want to be happy and live their life. That's it. I was in Bahrain, and I couldn't tell you how I laughed so hard. I literally had to stop and go get air because I was so excited and so happy because I met some people that really changed my life. The moment I realized that they didn't have to look like me for me to connect with them. I was in East Timor doing humanitarian work, and I met some people that had less than, my, than the worst of us, and you couldn't tell them that. They were so happy, so engaged, and so generous. They gave to us. You don't have anything, but they were just, well, what can I give you to show you that I'm grateful for you to be here? I learned generosity and kindness from people who had less than I did. I felt a little ashamed. But it's when we travel, when we expose ourselves, that is the greatest poison to not understanding one another is that we don't get exposed. Come meet some of us. Come meet the world. We're actually pretty awesome, all of us. That's the key. When we travel, we learn so much. When we expose ourselves, we get a different perspective, and that experience changes our culture, right? Because then we're saying, wow, I get it. I understand. Whether I agree or disagree, I'm going to just leave that in my pocket. Because it doesn't really matter. Because it really doesn't. Who are we to define somebody else's life for them? That's not our place. Or at least it's not my place. But what we can do, tell me, why do you think that way? What did you, how did you come to that conclusion? Let's get engaged. And so I wanted to leave a portion of the meeting open, at least this part, for a discussion, because I had some really interesting comments come through. And I wanted to at least give space so that we can kind of discuss them as a group. Because discussion, well, that's what I learn. I'm not learning anything. I've, this is this is this stuff. I, I know this stuff. This stuff I don't. And so I want to open it up so we can have a conversation about the things that I thought that were brought to my attention. What does that mean to cultural relativism based on what we understand now? And so, one of the things I I, I noticed was there was a, the example of George Washington, and the slave owner was brought to my, to brought to bear. But Ali, do you? Want to share your thoughts and comments? It was more on uh, Thomas Jefferson because he wrote this phrase, uh, what, inalienable rights, uh, when he owned slaves and he was basically violating a 14-year-old girl who was mm -hmm. a slave, uh, yeah, what, Hemings, Sally right. Hemings. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people now, they like to talk, think of it as a love story. When you see it in the context of this, of what Epstein da, did, you know, with 14-year-old girls, and right. they're so uh, critical of Ep Epstein, rightfully so. Uh, Jefferson gets a pass, and I guess if you want to go forward, and 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 I've heard the cultural relative relativism argument for Jefferson and for uh, George Washington for most of my life. It's, you know, well, you can't look at them like that. It's, they lived in a different time. They were men of a different era, et cetera, et cetera. But they were abolitionists in their time. You know, there was, was it William Lloyd Garrison, you know. They, John Henry Brown, right. Exactly. So it's not like uh, everyone back then wanted to own other human beings right. and uh, thought other human beings were less. So I, I guess if we are to go forward as a, a healed nation, then we have to sort of come to certain truths. We have to understand that our country was founded by white supremacists, period. Their words, if you read Jefferson's words, if you read Washington's words, even Benjamin Franklin, who I'm actually fond of, mm -hmm. they state that they're, they're, they're superior to uh, other races. Mm -hmm. So if, you if, we, we, you know, if we want to move forward and heal like an alcoholic who has to admit he's an alcoholic, then right. we need to admit these things, that's all. And, that's, and the cultural relatives, relativism argument for these racists needs to, to go away. Right, right. Thank you very much, Ali. I appreciate that. Yeah. Does anyone have a comment or retort or perspective? Yeah, just a thought to kind of uh, come off of what you said about truth. Um, you know, I'll just throw this at you to answer what you think. Uh, is, 
If something is true, is it true for all time, regardless of circumstances? So to enslave another human being, let's say we say that is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. All right, that's wrong, that. it's bad. Whether you're living in Greece in 5000 BC or George right. Washington or today. So it's a truth that is true across the board. Therefore, the apologies are needed, the changes are needed to uh, move forward. Your thoughts on that? That's a, that's a great observation. I will say that truth changes. It does, right? Because what was true 100 years ago isn't true today, right? It was true that getting from New York to California would take you three months, about two, 300 years ago. That was a, that was a fact. Some of your best navigators would tell you, yeah, for us to go from New York to California would be three months. That's the carriage, wagon, the whole nine. That was about 200 and something years ago. That was a fact. Is that a fact today? Technically, yes, if you had a cart, a horse, and wagon, yeah, it'd probably still take you. You'd probably take a little bit longer because people would be like, what the heck is going on here? Like, who is this in the cart and wagon? But so truth changes sometimes, right? Truth does change over time because Things change over time. Culture changes over time. What was true of African Americans, what was true of, of, any, of any culture at one point was a standardized truth until it changes. Society changes and therefore our truth changes, right? Uh, one pointed example, I'm trying to think of it as it, it's slipping my mind as I'm thinking about it. Um, it was true, Plessy versus Ferguson, 19, no, 1896. Plessy versus Ferguson said that, you know, separate but equal, right? It's true that you can't have separate but equal. You can have someone who sits there, and there's a chair, and there's someone who sits there, and there's a chair. That's equal, but it's separate. Is that true? Is it true? It could have been. Could have been, but the, the, but the statement is, is it true? Could it have been, it was it true then, and is it true now? It never was. Because if you looked at the conditions, equal means, the exact same. This chair is equal to this one in most rights. I'm sure there's some density differences, but <laughs> for the most part, these chairs are equal. Is that what you saw in the 1960s up from then? No. So truth, to your point, can be true to the society in which defines it. There's where cultural relativism exists. I define what is true for my society because slavery is an economic boomer, so therefore it is true that this is a good idea until it isn't. Everything is true until it isn't. I think I'm an amazing speaker until I am told otherwise. <laughs> it's true to me. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What happens when you change truth to morality? Morality, that's all, that, and that's beautiful because that's all cultural relativism. What I define as moral, you may not. Someone may be like, you know what? Hey, unprotected sex, that's my thing. I think it's okay. Someone else will be like, uh-uh, you get away from me for that, right? That's not my truth. That's not my, that's not my moral compass. And that's all based on our culture and our religious in, 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 uh, indoctrination, or at least our, in, our knowledge of whatever religious deity or whatever entity that are, or even secular thought that we adapt to. That defines our truth. If we're Christian, abortion's wrong. If we're not, it's not that big of a deal. Right, apart across the world, consensual sex is 16 years old. Here, 18, standard. The drinking age across the world is maybe 18 on a good day. Here, 21, no way. Which one's better? Cultural relativism. You can't say, because one could be good for one population and one could be bad for the other, right? Well, I served in the Marines. I couldn't get a beer until I was 21. I'd been through two tours of combat before that. Is it right or wrong? Cultural relativism is saying my culture defines moral compass, truth, and knowledge. My culture tells the world, as I see it, what's right and what's wrong. So yes, in your value, that morality of whatever, whatever you define, yes, that's true for you. And what happens is we, all, we often sit next to people that share the same ideas as we do, so that way we can feel conformed in our thoughts. And so therefore, we sit next to this gentleman and say, hey, 
You think the same way I do. Yeah. And this guy right here. And wait, these two, oh man, I'm in my zone. I'm good. But then I stand up and I say, wait a minute. You think something different. And you have a question, I'm gonna get to it in a second. What is your thought, right? And so we, that's, that, that, that moral compass is us defining that for ourselves, but that's our cultural relativism. What we understand to be true is what we project to everybody else. But. So I have a funny comment, because it's me, and then, uh, <laughs> then a serious question after that. So the funny comment is, um, uh, it's a quote. It says, uh, anyone they ever made a statue of was one form of son of a bitch or another. So um, <laughs> I think that's sort of true. Uh, the serious question is, there's certain news outlets, which shall remain nameless, um, that when you, how do you personally, when you try to bridge this gap with people, how do you defend that charge of, well, you're just doing identity politics, or you're, you're just trying to do, I mean, what, I, I'm asking how you deal with it, because I want to know how I can deal with it. That's a great question. So by identity politics, are you, is it more, there's another term called race baiting, where yeah. we, we use yeah. that to perpetuate, that is the media at its finest, unfortunately. <laughs> You know, and I, 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 have a, I have this dichotomy of, of, around the media and that, and I won't go into that because that's a whole different world, but it's a way in which we get people riled up, right? Because if the moment you say a white police officer assaulted a black person, then you got a whole storm on your hands, right? And so the media, that race baiting is, is what you, though these things are true, let me, let me, per capita, that's a fact, right? That it, I'm more likely to get pulled over and put in jail before any of you, unfortunately. It's just the way it is. Those are, the, those are truths that transcend culture, right? But my point being, race baiting is a way in which we wow people up because we see it's such a hot button. If you think about the 1930s, what was a hot button? Communism. The red, the iron curtain, that was the buzzword. So that everything that was red and common, it's, it's a way in which we get people, because if you understand social justice, you understand the model of social agitation. To get people to do something, you gotta get them pissed off, if you'll let me use that term of phrase, if, you, if that's okay. You gotta get them angry. You gotta get them, you gotta push their button right where it hurts, because that's when you're gonna get them to move. If I said fire, guess what, everyone's moving, right? If I said ice cream, same thing. Everyone's moving, right? It's <laughs> just in a different direction. But if I just said name tags, no one's moving, right? Because that's not what gets you, right? It, it, the media knows that you have to get riled up. You have to get engaged with somebody. And so therefore, they use the race baiting, is what they call it, to get people riled up. What do you do? Understand. Do your research. Are the claims that they're saying, are they true? If you don't want to do the research, then disregard the entire article. Because if you want to disagree or agree, you're just taking that out of your pocket and say, I agree with that statement. Even though I haven't really done the research, it just sounds right. That sounds right. We've just put our agree or disagree sticker on something. Put that in your pocket. Is it true? Is this that's being said accurate? Do your research. Find out. If, you, if it really is something that's interesting, this thing, I, is this better? I told you I was going to eat this thing. I'm, I should. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to. It's slipping down. I apologize. Let's do this. So my point being, uh, that idea, if, you, if something like that, if you see that in the media, do your research. See if it's true. If it's true, then you can make a decision if you want. But understand first before we pull that out of our pocket. I agree with that. I disagree with that. Right? So that, I think that, if, does it answer, does that help in some form, shape, form, or fashion? Okay, and I do have business cards over there on the media table, so if you have any questions or anything like that, just grab one, text or email me or whatnot, and I'll be more than happy to answer any other further questions for you. There's one question there from the gentleman here. Uh, yeah, so um, it would seem that a lot of our issues come from when our culture affects legislator. Like, you, we have good ideas that come in, the all humans being equal, but then they also have some really bad ideas. How do we divorce culture from legislature so we can have more pure rational thought in that process. Get rid of humans. <laughs> I, I, I mean, and all AI honestly, do it. Let the AI do it. Just <laughs> okay. I'm not commissioning anyone to do that, but I am saying that. Oh, fair enough. I, I think that. What I, as I tell my son, I tell my son this very point. I'm like, 
policy is a very, very slippery slope, but it, and I give a lot of respect to politicians because we have a lot of imperfect people trying to create a perfect plan. And they're doing the best they can based on their context and their understanding, relatively speaking. But yeah, there's some bad people that understand that if I can, if I can marginalize populations, I can then I can sub subjectify them to whatever I want, and I can make a lot of money off of that. Because race baiting and, and, and agitation is a big money maker. Guess what, why? Because we're still talking about it right now. So it's making money. The moment it stops, we stop talking about it, we stop listening to the nonsense, and we start doing our own research and start, re and start learning about what's really going on, media changes. But as long as we're biting, at the, if, we're, the, if they're casting their reel and we're nipping at it, they're gonna keep casting. Who knows how to fish? If they biting, keep, keep casting. Because when they stop biting, guess what? You, you, change your, you change your reel, you change your, your worm, you change your bait, you change everything because you need them to bite. And when you bite, they got you. And if it, it's on you to define if that's true or not. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Hi, ma'am, how are you? <laughs> RJ, geez. Ladies and gentlemen, RJ. It's more of a comment than a question. There's no such thing as race baiting and identity politics. It's made up. Um, there, uh, no, I'm, I'm serious because it's, if, if, if it comes from me and I'm talking about the issues of black women, they call that race baiting and it's absolutely not. Right. There are groups of people who for hundreds of years have been ignored in this country. I'm so glad, thank you for your presentation. I'm so glad you talked about redlining because a lot of people have never heard of redlining. They really do believe that they worked and they did, they worked to get what they have, but the difference is, is that people of color weren't allowed to have wealth or pass it on. And that makes a huge difference. And if you look at the time that Lyndon Johnson was in office, that's when the wealth gap started to shrink because we had, um, through yeah, law, right. changed a lot of the bigotries. And then it started to widen again when Reagan was in office. And so, and so policies and systems, um, really do impact the quality of our lives. Um, but, but the other piece of that is you have to have culture as a part of the conversation. You have to, otherwise people become ignored. And uh, an example of this would be Arizona. Um, they were talking about Arizona on the news this morning and how so many of our southern Republican states are on the dole to Democratic states to pay our bills and we have been in the top 10 to 15 states for poverty rates for as long as I've been here, which has been almost 40 years. So it, it's important um, to have that discussion about systems, about laws, about policies that affect communities that aren't white and male. I'm just gonna say it. If you ain't white and male, there's probably a problem that you're dealing with, some sort of an issue that can be impacted um, by policy, and those, those policies need to be well thought out, and they can come from um, uh, a, a combined um, a group of people with varied interests and ideas. But the other thing I wanna say is, there's a difference between truth and fact. Yes. My true. truth may have nothing to do with the facts. Correct, yeah. And so that's why truth can change, but facts do not. Thank you. And That's so, a great observation. I just wanted to say that. Thank you so much. Thank you, RJ. That was a great comment. We got one more question? I'm not sure this is, I think this is repeating several of the things that have been said. Sure. But if you do use the term race baiting, mm -hmm. white supremacist talk, et cetera, the result is that is that the majority of people that follow them do not think. That, that you know what, I, I can inherently agree with you on that. Sometimes it, what we, we don't go this, the next step. We, whatever the media tells us, we then accept that as our truth, to RJ's point, which may not be a fact. And until we identify the facts for ourselves, then we are adopting somebody else's truth, which then can perpetuate whatever behaviors and or understandings of cultures, people, and communities that you want to believe inherently. Because for me, if someone said, hey, you know what, all these people are terrible, I don't believe that. So regardless of the, their truth, my fact is that I don't believe that. And, I don't and that applies that. to big pharma, big egg, et cetera. Yes. So we got one more question. 
Hi, um, I was wondering if you'd be okay to share a bit of a story. You made a reference in the slide that you were homeless and part of the 70 on your way in the 70 percent, but you clearly went another direction, and I was curious about your story, if you're okay to share it. Sure. I'll be, I will give a few minutes to that, absolutely. Um, so my story in general, I, uh, I grew up in Los Angeles and I was homeless. And so my mother, my older brother and I lived on the streets for about four years, up until I was about five and then the state took us away. Um, I remember as a child sleeping in abandoned cars. I remember eating out of trash cans. Uh, I do remember as one instance uh, that I share in the story uh, through my philanthropic work, uh, my mother and my brother and I, we were so hungry this one California summer, uh, we broke into one of these people's houses. I don't even know where we were at. We broke into their house, um, and my mom took us to the refrigerator. We, had must, we must have been there before, because the people who owned the house, they grabbed chains, and they wrapped them around the doors of the refrigerator and locked it. Oh my goodness. And so when we got there, my mother was grabbing her two children, me being one of them. She comes to see this refrigerator, and it's locked. And she tries to open it, and of course, uh, can't. And so my mom takes my brother and I, and we go, she takes us to the bathroom, and she just sits there pondering for about a couple minutes. And she gets up, and she punches a hole in the wall as hard as she could. And I'm like, oh my god, my mom is like upset. She's scared. Like, what's going on? No. Actually, that's, she grabbed the drywall, and she began to eat it. Oh my and then she broke off a piece, and she gave that to me and my brother. That's dinner. You see, being poor, and having no money are two different things. We were both. The mindset was impoverished. And the environment was we had no resources. And so that's where I came from. That is m my personal story of where I started. And I've continued to push on. And so actually, because of that, thank you very much for saying I launch, I'm launching a podcast on September 1st talking about these stories and a lot of these experiences that have defined and made me who I am today. Because you realize, excuse me, we're all just people, really. We got to stop the petty stuff. I really, I really, if nothing else comes out of this conversation, let's stop that. Really? <laughs> If you, I told you in the beginning of the presentation that, that we were all the same, and I told you I would prove it. And so I want to go back. How many of you, by show of hands, think those dogs are the cutest thing you've ever seen? <laughs> <laughs> then there's no way we can be that different. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jason. I am, I, I neglected to tell everybody um, in your biography how kind and patient he is. This took a lot of emails going back and forth and questions from me and um, then I realized I'm trying to tell him what to do <laughs> about something I know nothing. So um, he's a wonderful man and I just wanted to tell you thank you very much for being here and all the work. He put lots of time into this. and. I want to, it's our tradition to mug our speakers, so thank you. <laughs> we hope you come back to, ha to get some more. Thank you, I'll get some coffee then. That's All right, get some for your touch. Thank you very much, thank you.